Right, okay. Um, good morning. Um, just checking. Can you see my screen? Can you listen to me? Can somebody confirm? Yes, sir. No. All right, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so our um, lesson today is going to take a while. Um, I have truncated um, a big chunk of it to uh, make it less complicated um, because I, I just I just realized that um, most of uh, you uh, are not very familiar with molecular work I mean like um, even though even though uh, there is a prerequisite to sit for this course um, advanced physiology but when I look at the uh, regular physiology or any other related uh, subjects that you took um, mostly uh, you didn't deal with um, uh, heavy things involving gene expression protein formation and stuff uh, and that thing is very important for the topic that we are going to have a look um, today. Nevertheless, um, there is first time for everything. So um, let's learn this um, uh, gradually because it is very interesting, okay? Um, the topic today, signal transduction in plant growth and development it's a very interesting topic because it does not only happen to plants, but it happens to every single living organism on this planet. In fact, if you take the, the word transduction, it doesn't only apply to living things, but also apply to any forms of uh, objects or things that are capable to provide response okay so um, if you wonder what's the meaning of transduction uh, maybe you have seen that word before uh, uh, in if you if you're reading or, or um, learning about the genetic transfer you know from one organism to another organism yeah that's a form of transduction as well. And the word transduction also might uh, appear in other disciplines of sciences, such as uh, physics or chemistry, uh, because transduction, for example, it, it simply means uh, changing the form of one thing to another. Uh, it can be anything. It can be matter. It can be energy and so on. For example, you're talking about um, the um, physical energy uh, sensed by your sense organs, such as you know, skin, uh, taste buds. Uh, they are transduced or they are converted to other form of energy, such as uh, nervous signals in your body. So you started with one form of um, stimulus, in this case, uh, physical touch. And then the moment it hits your skin, this stimulus is transduced into nervous signals, which travels along your nervous in your body all the way to your um, uh, brain so that you can bring about appropriate response to that. Okay, so for plants, um, the concept's pretty much um, similar, but the response can be very different. Okay. So we talk about the signals first. So I put here a bunch of signals that can have profound effect on plants to some degree. So the, these signals are regarded as exogenous signals and also endogenous signals. Exo mean, uh, means uh, anything uh, external, outside. Endo means internal. 
Okay. And we are going to look at, at some of these, not all of them, but to some degree, you're going to get some idea how the plant perceive the world, right? Okay. So the key concept that we're going to look at today, you need to understand that plant develop in response to the environment, even though there is a fixed genetic makeup and in plants, they still to some degree responds to the environment and to the point if the stimuli are very tremendous, they might not be able to complete their life cycles altogether, right? And we're going to revisit some of the um, fatal hormones such as gibberellins and auxins and a few examples of other hormones uh, like what you have seen in your um, um, first uh, physiology class, uh, not this class, uh, I mean like your, your um, um, regular physiology, how these hormones bring about changes in, in the plants. Okay, And finally, we're going to look at the, um, the effects of lights on, on the plants by the actions of photoreceptors and then the changes that they bring about in the cells, right? So factors involved in regulating plant growth and development, um, as you have seen just now in the, in the first slide, they can be exogenous and endogenous. But if the stimuli are present, but nothing are there to perceive or to uh, capture and interpret the signals, nothing much is going to happen. So you need to have your stimuli, your environmental cues, for example, day length, you know, maybe temperature and so on. And then you need to have the receptors, okay, to sense the environmental cues. Uh, in, in our case, uh, uh, at, um, at the final section of this uh, lesson, we're going to look at an uh, example of photoreceptors. And then the hormones in plants. So these are the chemical signals that will relay the information which are first perceived by the receptors. Okay, and finally, and well, not really ultimate final, but to some degree, the, um, the whole idea of having signal and response, the plant's genome, which encodes regulatory protein and enzymes, are triggered to do something specific. Okay. So remember, you start with your, um, we're working from um, outside towards the inside. Okay, so you have um, whatever signals that are coming from, from your environment. It can be light, it can be temperature, it can be wind and so on. And then the whole body of the plants are equipped with various receptors. So these receptors, they sense these cues or signals from the environment. And then these receptors, can they go straight to the um, uh, genome to do something about it? No. Receptors usually, uh, they don't move. There are some exceptions. Some receptors do move. They send something else, okay? Uh, we call this usually the, the secondary um, uh, substance. For example, uh, the hormones, so that these act like messenger to go to the site of action so that changes can be brought about, right? So in essence, these are the things that, that are going to happen. Okay. So all organisms receive the signals and respond to them in, in ways that are beneficial to that particular organism, okay? So the plants, the reason they respond to signals, uh, it's why, why? Because the parents told them to do so? No, it, it's pretty much for the survival of the species. 
the plants need to, uh, because the plant is pretty much immobile. It's not like you. Uh, in the, mom the moment your friend come and pinch you, you'll just uh, go away or you slap back. Plants can't do that. So they have to do something about it, usually internally, so that they can still survive despite the um, environmental aggressors that they may face. Okay. So, and you're going to see these are very specific. I mean, like some signals will be only perceived by some receptors only, and only certain things will happen. There is no such thing as one stimulus will cause all changes in plant. No. Okay. So these are very specific. So there are many pathways. Okay. So let's start with uh, the concept of reception. So you have your signals. Your signals need to be received perceive, uh, or, or perceived uh, by the receptors. So usually uh, receptors are proteins. These proteins, uh, they can be attached to the, um, the surface of the cells. So in this case here, the example that I put here, uh, we have a receptor here in blue, uh, which is located on the membrane surface, the plasma membrane. And the yellow thing here, the steroid, this is your signal. So this signal here is going to be attached to the um, your receptor. And remember, receptor, it's quite massive some, sometime. And in fact, it is called uh, by having a complex, meaning that it's, it comprises many parts. So the parts of the receptors are staying outside and another part is staying inside. So the steroid will bind to the receptor in this case. And sometimes there is a need for core receptor to come in place, meaning that you can see here, the cell wants to be very specific before any action is taken. You need the presence of receptor here you need the presence of the steroid here. So it's pretty much like padlock and key, the enzyme action, but nothing is going to happen as long as the co-receptor is not joined together as well. So when these all three things are present, they're going to be glued in together and then the signal transmission is going to happen. Okay, so once this is happening, then only a cascade of reaction is going to happen downward this way. And the intended phenomenon is going to happen. All right. So in this case here, we have the um, LRR, receptor kinase. Um, LRR stands for leucine rich repeat. Okay. And, and this is a very um, uh, famous um, uh, receptor. Um, in, in, in cells, okay? So, so after that, so you're done with here, with the receptor. So after the re receptor is done, you need to transduce the signals. Look at here. Does the signal, in this case the steroid, get into the cell? No. It's still um, not entering the cell. It just trigger the signals to happen, okay? So the steroid will bring about the changes along the way down here. And this is what is meant by the transduction. Okay. So um, got another um, uh, image here. So number one, what happened is the receptor ligand binding. So ligand is a, uh, like a short um, sequence of something like, like polypeptides. Uh, I just used the different uh, example here because I want you to know that uh, signals can be anything, okay? It can be chemicals of any classes, any categories. It can be, um, you know, ions. It can be salt. It can be anything, okay? For our um, 
example for our transduction, you can see that um, you have your receptor here. Still, it is embedded in the plasma membrane and it has got the um, inner part and outer part. So the outer part is going to bind to the um, ligand, the primary messenger, and then this primary messenger will cause the receptor to trigger the release of secondary messenger. Okay. So this secondary messenger is what is causing the signal transduction via the secondary messenger. Okay. So these uh, triangles here. So they're going to um, undergo various um, reactions as well. And then the, the fate for them is either they do the final job um, just in the cytoplasm, in the cytosol, or they cause uh, changes in gene reaction. Okay, So you can see that it's the steps are quite lengthy and it's like there are many, you know, um, checks here and there because the cell needs to be certain before any cellular responses or gene expression takes place. All right. So um, what are the um, uh, second messengers usually? Like? So they, they can be like, um, you know, uh, things like um, this. CGMP. Um, CGMP is the cyclic um, guanidine monophosphate. Um, I, I know it, probably you have not heard of that before. So um, it's it's uh, one of the uh, nu uh, nucleotides. You know your nucleotide ATCG? Yeah. That G here is here. Yeah. So uh, it has a monophosphate um, attached to it. So these compound CGMP can be uh, one of the um, second uh, messenger. Um, this thing can, re remember, have two fates. Either they cause the gene expression changes or they create direct cellular responses. So in this case, direct cellular responses can be Things like the increase in cytoplasmic calcium, all right? So when this happens, something else with, will happen. So it's like, like pretty much like a chain reaction, like the domino effect. One thing happens and it will cause the cascade of things to follow um, down the line, right? So once you're done with this, you're going to get your response. So the response here, um, when it comes down to this, site, the gene expression site, <clears throat> two things can happen. It can regulate the synthesis of mRNA, meaning that the gene expression is ready to be expressed. And also, after the, um, uh, the translation of the mRNA has taken place, the product, which is the protein, can be further modified. So please recall back from our first lesson, we did have a look at this. This is the central dogma of, of everything. So you have your nucleus, uh, your DNA, and then you're going to have the first step, which is the transcription. That's, that's where you get your mRNA. And this mRNA, it's going to undergo um, some processes and then it's going to be transported back out into the cytoplasm where it undergoes the translation process with the help of ribosome. Okay, so this is when you're going to get your first uh, protein. And this protein, even though it starts like a chain of amino acid before it is turned into the 3D structure, you know, due to the action of folding and various other things, this thing can be modified. So the response here, when it happens um, um, at the gene, genes level, two things can happen. It can regulate mRNA transcription or it can 
um, modify the protein which is uh, produced. All right. Okay. So let's look at uh, a bit closer. Uh, what is meant by the first um, situation? Transcription regulation. Okay. So the transcription factors will bind directly to a particular of DNA region. Okay. So this is your signal. Remember, I am going to repeat this various time because you need to have this concept in your head once and for all. Okay. So you're going to see that I repeat things many, many times. Because what's better way to learn about all of this thing? You're going to look at this thing multiple times, but from slightly different angles, meaning that things are flexible, but the concept is still the same. So you have your signals here, and then you have your receptor protein. Okay. Now look at, in this example, the protein here, it is not embedded in the plasma membrane. The protein, the receptor protein, it's actually in the cytoplasm, in the cytosol. So the hormone needs to get into the cell first. Once it is inside the cell, it will bind with the receptor protein, right? So when this happens, this hormone receptor complex will get into the nucleus, and then these will bind to the tra uh, transcription factors to cause the some genes to be expressed in first in the form of mRNA. So if you have this, you just activate um, um, an expression of a gene, right? That's why it says here, um, activation of positive or negative or both type of transcription factors has effect on the mechanism by which signal promotes a new developmental cause, right? So what happened here is pretty much what have been emphasized here. So this, what you learn just now here, actually just this part, okay? Just this part, right? Okay. So. Let's look at the second phase that's going to happen. What what kind of response that can happen? First, you have you know now that the gene expression can be regulated through the production of mRNA. Okay, so even after the mRNA has been um, translated, okay, by the help of ribosome, that's why you get your protein this protein can be further changed. How? That's even more complex. Okay. So the post-translational modification of protein um, is, is very important. So because it's, you, you see, protein is not like a string of amino acids. Okay. Even though some proteins do look like that, but many of them are actually quite complex. Okay, so the modification that can happen um, to the protein which has been synthesized can be many, many kind of modification. It can be um, acetylation, phosphorylation, methylation, ubiquitination, and so on, right? This protein here, this protein which is newly uh, found here, who who does all these changes here? You need to go back to here. Remember, we got two paths here. So one path, the second messenger caused the changes. So it can be that there is an, another um, receptor here that bring about the changes to the protein which is outside the nucleus. So you already have your protein here, which needs to undergo post-translational process. And this post-translational process is, can be due to this number three. Second messenger, cause the changes. What kind of changes? These changes. Okay. It, can, it, can, it, can be, it can be many things. Okay. So, I mean, like, just look at... Um, um, 
the enzyme in Calvin cycle, uh, the Rubisco. To make Rubisco, um, you need two to, uh, two sources of um, of DNA it, it, from the nuclear DNA from uh, the chloroplastic DNA as well. Yeah. So the ribo ri ribosome get inputs from various places okay, before it is turned into a working enzyme. Okay. So think of Rubisco because I know you're familiar with that by now. Rubisco, it's not a blob of enzyme. It's actually made up of uh, what we call as um, um, subunits. So Rubisco has the um, large subunits and also the small subunits. And before these subunits are brought together to form a functional enzyme, uh, various of these things are happening along the way. Okay, so you can see that how complex things can be before a response is elicited or happening. Okay. All right. So um, I think we should talk about hormone now um, because you have learned about the phytohormones, right? So even though the, the signals can be anything, it can be hormone, it can be um, ligand, your polypeptides, it can be steroid, it can be anything. But for, for agriculture, you're going to use um, a growth uh, regulators a lot. So um, we're going to focus uh, on, on that because hormones is something that you can also associate it with humans okay? because we got hormones as well, right? So what are actually hormones? There are chemical signals that act very, at very low concentration, okay? Far from the sites where they are produced, okay? So um, whatever hormones there are you, that you are dealing with, these are sensed and perceived by the, by the receptors, okay? So what about uh, special receptors like photoreceptors? So photoreceptors, um, they are actually pigments, okay? Uh, pigments, uh, and they absorb signals in the form of light, in the form of energy, okay? So you have um, regular receptors like this, receptor like this, which sense hormones, and then you have other types of receptor, photoreceptor, which are not really um, looking for hormones specifically, but they're looking um, for certain lights in order to activate them, okay? And of course, this thing, even though it's complicated, but the concept is still the same, okay? So let's talk about hormone and also um, tropism because um, by now, I hope you understand. Let's, um, let's put it this way. So you have your signal and then the signal is going to be sensed by your receptor. And after that, receptor is going to, due to the action of second um, um, messenger and so on, it will cause respond. Okay, so this is just to recap with you. Signal can be what? It can be anything, anything. It can be um, hormone, it can be ligand polypeptide, polypeptide, it can be steroid, whatever. Okay. So receptor, receptor, it can be um, on the membrane, plasma membrane, okay? It can be present in cytosol, okay? So response can involve something like um, uh, control. Uh, you can 
up regulate or down regulate just in case you don't know how to spell it so this is up regulate up regulate this is down regulate Um, gene expression why this thing is um, a bit choppy um, expression um, in the form of mRNA transcription transcription okay or response can also happen um, post translation post translation meaning that you're dealing with protein modification okay so this is the the, the general concept okay you start with signal signal sensed by receptor receptor send the second messenger to create a response okay so the signals that we are going to um, have a look in a bit uh, are signals like the hormones now, and also light. Okay. We don't have time to cover all signals on this planet. So let's, let's, let's use the very common signals that you're going to deal with. Okay, so blood hormones can help coordinate growth, development, and responses to stimuli. These words, tropism, it's basically the, the um, growth response away or towards um, the direction of um, stimuli. For example, the phototropism, growth towards light. If it's towards, this is positive tropism. If it's um, growth away from light, this is negative tropism. Negative, uh, specifically, negative phototropism. So tropism, uh, it's from the word tropo, which means to turn. Okay. It depends on it's going to happen depends on the stimulus that come that is perceived by by the plants there are many type of uh, tropisms okay i'm sure that you have been learning uh, about this from school we've got phototropism geotropism thickmotropism hydrotropism chemotropism and thermotropism and there are three main types that we are usually uh, have to deal with phototropism so this is um, light um, geotropism, so this is gravity. Thigmotropism, this is touch. Hydrotropism, this is uh, water. Chemotropism, this is usually um, chemicals or substance. Substance. Thermotropism, that's a heat. Heat or um, temperature. And these are all the signals. And when these signals have caused any form of um, response or phenomenon, they are called the tropism. Here, yeah, all of this, okay? We got the response. Okay, in the form of tropism. <clears throat> okay, so I just I just put this to, to give you some perspective about the plant hormones and also animal hormones. I mean, like uh, like mammals, like us, the hormones that are present in you. So the plant hormones, the phytohormones, they are small, okay, uh, molecules, and animal hormones as well. They are very small, okay, hormones very small. Otherwise, you cannot produce them in large amounts and they cannot travel very swiftly. 
site of synthesis throughout the plants. Okay. However, for the plant, for the animals, you need special glands or cells to do that. Okay. That's why we have glands in in um in our body. We have what do we have? Pituitary glands, adrenal glands, thyroid glands, and each of these glands produce specific hormones. Okay. To the point, it's gender specific. Okay. You cannot um you cannot say your 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 friend uh which is a, a male friend having um um uh, dominance over um estrogen and uh, progesterone okay because uh, that's not possible he's a male okay that's um even though some amount of estrogen is present that's not dominant okay so very specialized side of action uh, local or distant. So, um, hormones um, in, in plants um, can be like traveling all over the body of the plants. Okay. But it, it can also be used, um, you know, in the near tissue. But for animal hormone, usually it's, it's distant. I think we can thanks to our blood circulation for this. Okay. Uh, you you have your growth hormone, which is produced by your uh, thyroid glands, and um, oh no no no, growth hormone is not produced by thyroid gland. I need to check check that. Sometimes um my 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 human biology kind of messed up as well because I learned that um long time ago. Let's have a look. Growth hormone is it the um adrenal uh, adrenal Adrenal glands or the thyroid gland? Growth. I'm showing you this to, to, to make a point that when you are unsure, you can search. Don't wait around. Growth hormone glands. What glands? Pituitary gland. Yeah. yeah. It's not thyroid gland, okay? It's pituitary gland. Where is it located? Yep, it's in your brain, your pituitary gland. Okay, so this is what controls your growth hormone. Growth hormone is not only uh, released when you are kids; it's it's released throughout your life. Okay, uh, it's something that you might want to take a note about. Okay, and the effects uh, of the hormones are very diverse. Uh, effects of animal hormones are very often specific. This point you need to bear in mind. Okay, plant hormones like what you have learned so far, oxygen, you know, gibberellin, abscessic acid, and so on, they, the, the function of these hormones can be multitude of functions, okay? But hormones in, in animals, they're very specific, okay? The lut luteinizing hormones will involve in the in the in the release of the aches in the follicles in the ovary, okay, Lut luteinizing hormone has nothing to do with controlling your growth to make to make you taller, all right. So um, the action is very very specific, okay. Regulation is decentralized, meaning that it's not it's not um, caused by a brain. Plants do not have brains like you, okay, but uh, hormones in in animals, uh, we we have brains, so our brain pretty much. Uh, control the the um uh, the actions of these hormones when they are produced and so on. Okay, so I uh, I just put here uh the major functions of um of of various uh, regular hormones that that you have dealt before. This is for your revision. Okay, we're not going to read all of them at at at, at all at once, but it's enough to to know that the auxins um do things like you know. Um, growth, um, elongation, and that kind of stuff. Cytokinin for you know triggering um, cell division, uh, gibberellin um, to stimulate um, elongation, rapid growth. Yeah, resinosteroid um, involved with the um, uh, stem uh, stem elongation and division, and also uh, involved with the um, negative or antagonistic effect with the um, abscessic acid yeah 
uh, to, to prevent the leaf or your fruit from falling to the ground. Okay, it retards leaf abscission. Okay, right, you got your abscess acid, something that you get when your plants are under stress, you know, um, during drought. Um, Plants need to conserve water, so the stomata are closed. How they close? Due to abscess acid and ethylene. It's due to uh, it's a gaseous. Okay, of all of these hormones, ethylene is the only one in the form of gas. Others, um, no. Okay, so ethylene is um, um, responsible for the um, uh, ripening and softening softening of the plant um, tissue, and also to some degree the leaf abscission. Okay. Right. So the point that you need to take uh, now is um, uh, oxygen and gibberellin actually, um, they have diverse effects, okay? Oxygen usually associated with um, growth. Gibberellin usually associated with elongation and also seed germination. But their mechanism of actions um, are actually overlapping. Right. So, um, oxygen was discovered um, when people were, were, were making efforts to, to study phototropism. Okay. It is made in, um, in shoot apex uh, and diffuses down the shoot in one direction. It's polar transport. So, the thing you need to know about oxygen and to some degree gibberellin as well is this thing, polar transport. Okay. There is a whole dedicated thing studying about this polar oxygen transport you can have your phd just on this okay so polar oxygen transport even though it says only oxygen here remember this thing to some degree uh, is applicable to gibberellin as well right so um oxygen enter the cell by passive diffusion okay there is no 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 specific gate or protein needs to, to transport oxygen Okay, and it causes the proton pumps to pump uh, hydrogen out of cells, okay, to make one side more acidic than the other. Remember, when you have lots of hydrogen ion, this H plus in one side. I do not know why my pen is choppy today. So this side is acidic, okay, compared to this side. Yeah, right. <clears throat> okay. Um, and also, uh, oxygen uh, has a uh, various form. Okay. So in this in this example, it's called the um um I A A. Oxygen is a name of a hormone class. Under oxygen, there are many many species. Okay. It can be IAA, it can be IBA, indole butyric acid, uh, indole acetic acid. They are all oxygen, okay? And they are ionized in higher pH of the cytosol, right? Ionized oxygen exit via oxygen and ion flux carrier that are concentrated at the basal end of each cell. Where are these? Right. So... Look at the diagram here. So this is your cell, and then you your cell wall, the yellowish part here, and then you got your plasma membrane, and then you got your oxygen, right? Your A here, the oxygen here. Oxygen will exit, like it says here, at the basal of each cell. Okay, there is an exit uh, for the anion flux. Remember, anion is negative. Okay. So oxygen will exit here to go to the next cell. It doesn't move the other way round. Okay. No. Because it is polar transport. It is unidirection towards one, one direction. So I'll put the, the definition here. <coughs> what is meant by polar transport. And also there is a this is to show you whether is it true oxygen is only moving uh, uh, in one direction yes this is the experiment and when you put oxygen uh, at the top it will come to uh, towards the bottom but if you 
put oxygen at the bottom, it doesn't go towards the top. Okay, so the words that you need to uh, get introduced today is like the basic petal, acropetal. Basic petals meanings uh, simply means towards base. Acropetal simply means towards apex. Okay, so that's why it moves toward this direction. When it has this kind of direction, it's polarized. It's towards one side only. We call it polar transport. Okay, right. And the um uh, this polar transport is is what drives uh, to some degree the uh, phototropism. If you have light um towards this way, oxygen because it is polar, it will migrate these red dots here. It will migrate to uh, one side here to the lateral side here or towards uh, a downwards motion and when enough of oxygen has accumulated in one side remember oxygen cause stem uh, cell elongation this side will elongate more than this side here okay when this elongate more while nothing happened for this side, you're going to get your band. Okay? Yeah. Because this, this side is not growing. This side elongates. Okay. That's why. Does that mean oxygen getting away from the light? Yeah. Uh, some theory says that oxygen actually um, trying to, to go away from the light. So light coming from this way, oxygen migrates um, to, the, to the opposite side. Um, sense the word. Opposite. Opposite means polar. Go to the opposite side or towards uh, the uh, downwards um, region. Okay. All right. To some effect, um, gibberellin as well. Okay, when you have your light, this is what happened to your plant from one direction. See, the plants um, grow toward that as well. Okay, so the effects uh, which is experienced by the um, gibberellin is also um, the same. Okay, they, um, they kind of work um, together because the, the functions kind of overlap. Remember, plant hormones, the functions can overlap. Your hormone, human hormones, no, not overlapping, okay? Estrogen uh, do not overlap the function with uh, growth hormones, okay? Or insulin for that matter, all right? They, they have things uh, to do on their own. Okay, so um, just to remind you, uh, the very classic example of what gibberellin do. Um, gibberellin, uh, it, it can make your fruit, the best example here is grapes, to enlarge, to elongate, even without the formation of seeds. Okay, so, and that's why people keep spraying um, uh, gibberellin here. And this is, um, I think this condition is called partino, how to spell it, copy. Okay, you form the fruits, without seeds, okay? Usually, uh, to get fruits by the natural law, you need seeds formation as well, right? Because that's what triggers the fruits to enlarge. No, if you spray the hormones, uh, like the gibberellin here, because it can enlarge the cells, you're going to get your fruits anyway, okay? And then gibberellin, uh, this is the specific function of gibberellin, okay? Just, I don't want you to confuse with, with oxygen. Even though there are um, um, functions overlap, there are functions which are specific to gibberellin, okay? And gibberellin is known to help with the um, uh, seeds germination. So the embryo release the gibberellin into the endosperm. This is endosperm. And this uh, will cause the food reserve in the endosperm, like the complex uh, carbohydrate like starch, to break down into monomer, into simpler 
uh, sugar unit. And this sugar can be used by the embryo to germinate, to germinate so that you get your plemium, the shoot, and also the radical, the baby roots. Okay, so auxins have roles in um, gravitropism, okay, in the gravity, okay. Because of auxins' actions, even though you have your plants like this, okay, my drawing is not that great, but bear with me. Even though there is a gravity acting on the plant, pulling the plant downwards, due to the action of auxin, so you got your auxin a lot here, causing the plants to, to grow, it will cause um, the shoot to experience negative gravitropism. Tropism. Okay, meaning that the shoot does not allow, does not follow the gravity direction. Okay, gravity, is it a signal? Yes, it's a signal. Oxin, is it a signal? Yes, it's a signal as well. But oxin has higher dominance over it. So your shoot will still grow out, upwards. Okay, but your roots will follow the gravity. Okay. Um, why? Why your why your root uh, follow gravity, not the oxin? Okay, so um, we're not going to 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 discuss a lot about that today. But it's I I can tell you it's due to the special type of uh, a myeloplast. Plast, uh, a myeloplast. Uh, it's called special myeloplast. There is a name for that. Uh, Statolis. Statolith. Lith means rock. Stat stamp comes from starch. Yep. Very dense starch, like rock, that um, deposits at the bottom of root cells. So that's why your roots going downwards. It follows the gravity. Okay, do we have this? Do we have this rock? Yes, you have this rock. But in, in, in human, it's not called statolith. It's called um, otolith. It's in your ear. Okay, that's for your balance. Okay, similar structure. Um, you got rocks in your ear. You got rocks um, in, the, in the root cells. But root cells is uh, so that the roots go grow towards the gravity to anchor. Okay, but the rocks in your ear is for balance. Okay, I hope you can, to some degree, recall your human biology that you have learned before. Okay, yeah. So this is the the effects of negative tropism uh, of the shoot, right? So you have your your shoot here with with oxin, but um, it doesn't grow this way anyway. No. This is still the way. So that's why it's called oxin cause um, negative tropism of the shoot. Okay. All right. When, how about at the level of the entire plant? Okay. So if you have a tree like this, if you measure oxin from the top, to uh, the peak of the tree, you're going to see that the oxygen concentration is actually rather high um, at the base of the plant canopy compared to the top of the canopy. So that's why the top or uh, the, the, the bottom of the plant canopy it's a lot bushier. Yeah, that's why it's bushier because oxygen promotes growth yeah oxygen promote growth why why oxygen concentrated in here in the first place because oxygen undergo the special transport what is it recall back what you, you just saw this thing yeah. 
this thing, this polar transport, you see? Top to bottom, top to bottom, bicipedal direction. Even though the oxygen also produce top here, they have the tendency to go downwards. So eventually, lots of oxygen are accumulated here. Then you got lots of branch branchings um, at the lower region of the tree, right? So uh, that's why we have usually we have plants in this shape. Okay. All right. Um, how how oxygen cause the cell to elongate? Something to do with the acid growth hypothesis. So oxygen cause the protons pump to pump um, uh, hydrogen into the cell wall and also it activates expansin. This is a type of protein, okay? It loosens the cell wall, okay? Oxygen increase the synthesis of proton pumps and then expansin also work together to loosen the cell wall and to cause them to elongate like this. Okay, so you have your oxygen. This is your signal. Oxygen will cause uh, some genes to be expressed. What are the genes? Genes that synthesize proton pump. So the more oxygen you have, the more proton pumps will be present. More proton pump present, meaning that more hydrogens are going to be available in your uh, cell wall. This yellow bit here, this is cell wall. When you have more hydrogen in your cell wall, your cellulose will become loosened. They're going to, you know, uh, not very become very compact uh, anymore. And also with the actions of expansion, which works very well in acidic environment, your cell will start to elongate. Usually, this is your cell wall with the action of the hydrogen. Can, can you see any oxygen here? There is no oxygen here. Remember, oxygen is just the signals. Okay? Oxygen is just the signal. Cause the uh, gene expression of proton pump. Proton pumps cause the hydrogen to be present in abundance in the cell wall. And then because of hydrogen and also uh, the um, presence of uh, expensive, the, the, the protein, the cross-linking of polymers in your cellulose microfibrils fibrils, will loosen up. Okay, so that's why your um, your cell can elongate and can grow, okay? Oxygen do not cause direct um, um, uh, change to, to the uh, cell, okay? So I hope your understanding about this can be corrected. Because I got students um, from, from my previous class uh, asking about this. So I have a feeling that time that most students will think that oxygen cause the cells directly get into the cell somehow and then cause the cell to elongate. No, actually, it's not the, the, the case, okay? It's oxygen is just the signal. It's, it's a hormone, okay? It's the hormone. It's pretty much like the uh, growth hormone produced by pituitary gland. We know that growth hormones um, during your teen, teen, teenage, teenage years, you, is um is is abundant and that's why you increase in height okay you become taller but is it because of your growth hormone your bones elongate you know your, your pituitary produce a growth hormone and then this growth hormone go to the bones and make the bones to to elongate no that's not the case Growth hormone just cause the 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 uh, meristematic cells, uh, the bone marrow of your cells, to become more active, and get more nutrients so that they can produce more bone. Therefore, makes you taller. So it's pretty much the same like what happens here. Hormones are signals cause the response, which is cell elongation. Okay, all right, all right. So like um. 
So what happens um, in variety of plants that you know, right? We've got uh, various crops, which are dwarf crops, they are tall. What happens actually? So um, there is a, a, a protein, a repressor, uh, repressor of transcription factor that stimulate expression of growth promoting genes. So this repressor got two domains and what happened is, I just want to show you this thing actually. Yeah. So auxin or gibberellin will bind to a receptor and this receptor will bind to a transcription factor. What does this transcription factor do? It will cause um, uh, the, 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 the cell to, to elongate. But in tall mutant, the repressor does not bind to the transcription uh, complex. Okay. What, what happened is this. This bit here. This bit here. That's why it's called repressor. It repress. It stops. If it binds to the transcription factor. Um, like um, like this case. You get your dwarf mutant. Because repressor always bound to the transcription factor. This condition. When you have this condition, you will have a dwarf um, uh, variety. Okay, but if your um, repressor is not present, so you got your um, um, your transcription going on, rep rep repressor does not bind. You will get a tall mutant. Okay, so two 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 situations here. Yeah. So, what determines the repressor will bind or not? Gibberellin or auxin. Can the re repressor on its own um, bind um, to the transcription factor? No. It will be only activated with the presence of gibberellin or auxin. Okay. So, the moment it binds to the um, transcription factor, you will get your dwarf uh, variety. If it doesn't bind, there is no repressor, you will get your tall mutant, like this one. So this is the example. Okay. And this is another example, supplying auxin to this mutant of plant to make it grow. All right. So originally, the plant, this is what you get if you do nothing about it. But the moment you spray with gibberellin, your tomato suddenly becomes super big and it managed to flower. Yeah. Just to prove this thing, gibberellin and auxin have the similar signal transduction pathway. Okay. So this tomato you spray with gibberellin. This, um, this plant, this is Arabidopsis actually. We don't have this plant in Malaysia. Um, Arabidopsis. Okay, so this is tomato. Okay, so we do not have this plant in Malaysia. It, this is called, uh, I do not know, it's something like, you know, cress? Cress? Water cress? I don't know, what, what is it called in Malay? Oh, do I know? Maybe I know. Uh, I think in Malay it should be Poco um, Salada. Yeah, something like that. Okay. Right. So you can you can you can see they have similar actions, both gibberellin and auxin. Okay. Provided that the, the repressor is not is not getting um in the way. All right. All right. Okay. So look at let's look at um other what other um gases that can be present as well. 
um, for uh, for the you know plants uh, signals uh, transduction pathway. We got ethylene. So ethylene, you know, that's the gas that involved in your fruiting. Yeah, lots of ethylene. You're gonna get a very super bright um, tomato. Yeah. However, I think one thing you didn't probably you didn't learn uh, in your um, original fundamental physiology is ethylene is actually in um, causing this triple response. When you have loss of ethylene, you're going to get short stem. I would like to call it this way. Short stem, fat root, um, and uh, another one is actually, oops, sorry, this thing. So it should be um, lateral growth lateral growth, okay? So um, this triple response is very um, peculiar to um, um, ethylene. Yeah. Oh yeah, I got, I got an example here. Yeah. So we got two um, seedling here. You can see that um, when the seedlings is treated with um, the ethylene, it's going to be short, it's going to be fat and pretty much there is no growth here. Yeah, compared to the normal one, it looks slender, it looks tall and there is, a, you know, the growth of uh, the, the roots. You got the, this growth, this kind of growth, okay? Which is, which is, this is good because you can use this to select uh, in, in breeding, you can use this to select for a special type of plants, okay? So you, you have your um, um, many, many seeds, your crop seeds, uh, suspended in mutagen. Mutagen are the chemicals uh, that cause mutants um, in, in, in the any plant species, okay? So, after you have treat your seeds with uh, mutagen, you let them grow, you let them grow, but at the same time, you also give ethylene. So normally, when you give ethylene, all of them are going to be short. All of them are going to be fat like this. But if you manage to cause a mutant, like in this case, one seedling is going to be the opposite of everything. So you know that this one has mutated. Okay, and this one, they, they're still not mutated. Nothing, nothing is happening. So you pick up this one, use, use for your further study. Yeah, right? So it's a, it's a tool um, in, in research, right? Okay, and cyto, cytokinins, uh, cytokinins, uh, as you know, it, it promotes the cell division. So what actually it do um, is primarily delay senescence of the leaf. So this is the experiment, a short experiment. You have two leaves uh, from, from, from a plant when you, um, deep in, in, in cytokinins, this one um, is ad actually advancing in age, okay? All right? And, and, the, and another one is not very much uh, advancing. So this one is the with the cytokinin. This one with the control. So this one is aging, okay? So it's yellowish. This one still look healthy and young looking. So you can you can say that cytokinin is actually the anti-aging um, um, substance uh, for the plants, right? The more the more the plants have, uh, the 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 longer it will take for the plant to senesce and and undergo aging, right? Okay. So how does cytokinin works? So again, you uh, you're gonna have to have around your receptor, 
and also the target um, protein. So this is how your cytokinins work. So this is your cytokinin, and this is uh, your receptor AHK. AHK is, uh, what is it? Arabidopsis histidine kinase. Yeah, that's the name, the long name of it. Oh yeah, I put it, I put it down here. AHK, the receptor, oh, Arabidopsis histidine kinase, yeah, AHK. So when this happens, it will cause the genes to, to be some specific genes to um, express. Okay? And these genes are important to ensure that the plants are younger looking all the time. Right? Yeah. All right. So, um, however, this is not the only way the cytokinins is, um, is expressed. Okay? Remember, signals, receptor, response. Okay, signals, receptor, respond. I want to highlight to you this thing here. The receptor here. This receptor, it's not directly caused the gene expression to be upregulated or downregulated. Sometimes you're going to see that this receptor, along the way, they got lots of this P. So this process is called phosphorylation. By the action of kinase. Yeah. So they become multiple time phosphorylated over, over, over the time before they are become, uh, you know, active and um, cause the gene transcription to happen at, at, at the specific site, right? Right. Okay, what about other hormones? Brassinosteroids. Okay, I don't think you, you learned a lot about this before, right? So, basically, it enhances uh, cell elongation, promotes xylem differentiation, growth of pollen tubes, and so on. So, um, this actually overlaps overlaps with with some other PGRs. Okay? Right? Let's see what happens when you have defect in brassinosteroid. So, when brassinosteroids are not properly expressed, meaning that there is nothing like this happening, you are going to have your plants Stunted. Yeah. So the plants can have um, um, other hormones present, but if one hormones are taken out of the equation, like in this case, the brassinosteroids, it is still going to look very, very weird and ugly like this. Okay. So they have to work together, okay? So that's 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 why, um, you know, no one thing can be too important or everything, okay? Everything work in a concert, okay? So, right. So this is the final section, and this is uh, something to do with the photomorphogenesis, how lights um, initiate a developmental uh, response. The things that you need to understand here are this. There are... Um, receptors for specific colors, okay? So we have the blue light photoreceptors and also for, for blue light, of course, and we got phytochromes for the red light uh, receptors, okay? Yeah, so photoreceptors, um, um, it's actually the one that perceive the uh, the light signals. However, it doesn't give the the uh, the color. Okay, so the color is actually given by this thing, the chromophore. Okay. So take 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 like the chloro chlorophyll. Okay, chlorophyll. Okay, so chlorophyll uh, molecule. It's um. Why is it green? You, you learned that before, right? You learned before, chlorophyll and your blood hemoglobin, 
they look pretty much um, uh, similar, except chlorophyll is green due to the presence of magnesium in the middle of the porphyrin ring. However, your, um, your uh, hemoglobin, instead of having magnesium, has got uh, the iron in the middle. So that's what determines the color of the, uh, um, the, the pigment. Okay, so you have various photoreceptors in plants. You have um, uh, cryptochromes, phototropines, and also the phytochrome. So cryptochromes and phototropines, these are meant to sense blue light. Okay, what are they actually? They're actually a protein, protein plus chromophore. Okay, so they only perceive blue light and then phytochromes, they um, perceive for uh, the red light. Okay, why is this important? All right. So here's a little experiment, and when lights of various colors are given to um, the uh, growing coleoptile, coleoptile, remember that's the the sh the shift cap for the grass, like um, rice, corn. Okay. These are the coleoptiles. When you give it all colors, red, yellow, green, the coleoptile is not bending. But the moment you give the blue light region, so when we say blue light region, it includes uh, the UV as well, okay? The coleoptile start to bend towards it. Okay, so from this, um, short experiment, it can be said that the phototropic bending to a light is caused by a photoreceptor that is sensitive to blue and violet light, particularly blue light. So this was from the beginning. They didn't know that the, um, the name of the um, uh, photoreceptor just yet. This is quite recent, all these phototropins um, perceive uh, blue light. But they know. Okay? They know. Um, you're going to get more bending of your coleoptile if you give um, the violet-blue light region, okay? Yeah, so this is, um, so, so this, is, this is the absorption spectrum of the phototropism for the, for at least for the coleoptile. You can see that in this region, the region of 436 nanometer, there's a lot of absorption. The moment light is absorbed, things will happen. The moment light is not absorbed, nothing will happen because light is a signal. The moment signal is absorbed, who absorbs the receptor? Receptor will cause a cascade of reactions to cause response. And in this case, the response is the bending of the coleoptile. Okay, other colors, um, do they absorb? Well, according to this um, finding, they don't absorb. It, it, it is as simple as that. When there's nothing absorbed, nothing going to happen. When the something is absorbed, something will happen. And in this case, it's going to be bending. You can see that this is very specific. Blue light causes the bending. Will the blue light cause the coleoptile to produce flower? Will the blue light cause the coleoptile to run away? No, it's, it's only one reaction, one, one response only, which is the bendings. That's why I said from the earlier, this is very, very specific, okay? All right, so, so enough with the uh, phototropin. So uh, what are the photoreceptor for blue light? Things like cryptochromes and also phototropins, okay? Okay, let's move to the phytochromes. So phytochromes, they are the receptors for the red light. What are the um, wavelength? Around 650 to 680 nanometers. Okay. So and red light uh, uh, can also be in farther um, lambda. So this is your lambda, okay, your wavelength. Remember? So these are what we call as far red. 
far red. This is the red. Can you see this? Not really. Can you feel it? Yes. You can start to feel this in the form of heat. Slight heat. Okay. So the higher this number, yeah, the, they, they're going to, you're not, you're not going to be able to, to see them. Okay. Because our retina is not designed to, to see this. Right. So this is the little experiment. Um, when you have your red light and then followed by darkness, you're going to get most of your seeds are going to germinate your um, lettuce seed. When you have your red light and then followed by far red light and then darkness, you get some germinates. If you use red, far red, red, far red, red, far red, red, far red, you can get pretty much like this as well. Okay. But if you start with red light, and in between, you kind of play around, red, far, red, red, far, red, red, far, red. But at the end, you use the far, red. Few will germinate. Very few will germinate. So what does it say, tell to you? Okay. This completely say that this red, as long as it's at the beginning and also at, at the final stage, the germination will happen and it doesn't matter what, what happens here okay and as long as at the final light regime it is not far red it will germinate the moment you put a far red nothing will germinate so this tells you that the far red actually inactivates something inactivates while red activates Activates what? You will see in a bit. Yeah. So yeah, um, don't worry too much about this. This is just the, the, the details of the experiment, what, what, what happened actually. Yeah. So if you give the white light, you got this much of germination. If you get give this um, uh, treatment, red, then far red, then red, you get the most uh, germination. Okay. Right. So, um, but the least of light combination you're going to get from red red and then you end it with far red okay the moment you end it with far red you're going to get very few germination dark of course that's going to get um, um, uh, because there's no energy at all how how the the how the um, seed is going to germinate there's no signal nothing even if you give a small amount of red light, you're still going to get lots of germination. Okay? Yeah. Why is that? Yeah, it's due to this. This phytochrome. This phytochrome. It can be in its active form. It can be in its inactive form. How does it change? Okay. When it's in active form, you're going to get all of this. Okay, so PFR, this is your phytochrome active. Okay, when your phytochrome is in active form, you're going to get all of this. You're going to get seed germination, flowering, and also shoot development. When it's phytochrome is in inactive form, you are not going to get any of this. How does it happen? Um, I think I've got a picture down here. I'll just go into jump here. Yeah. Due to this red light present. So when the red light is um, slightly of higher energy and shorter, 660 nanometer, your phytochrome will be activated. Yeah. But the same phytochromes when it receive um, red light of uh, longer wavelength, several hundred thirty, it will deactivate. Okay, so this happened during the day. Okay, and this happened during the dark, dark or shade 
or night. Okay, yeah. Like what? Like um, it can happen during the day. For example, like the understory of uh the forest. That's 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 rather dark, right? Yeah. So it's rather dark. It will inactivate the phytochrome, and this is actually what happens. Okay, this is your plasma membrane. Plasma membrane. This is your cytoplasm. See, this is your um, phytochrome. Okay, phytochrome in the form of inactive. Okay, so the phytochromes in the cytoplasm, the moment it receives red light of 660 nanometer, there is a range uh, about that, this range here. So it's it's around 650 to around 680. It will activate the phytochrome. This phytochrome will, you see, this is the magic here. The phytochrome will get into the nucleus and then it will bind to transcription factor. Okay, so and this will cause the transcription of genes that stimulate Stimulate what? Seed germination, flowering, and shoot development. Okay, so that's why it's very important to some species to receive at the beginning the red light, not the far red light. The moment you give far red light, even though at the beginning you use um, red light and suddenly you decide to give the far red light, the far red light will deactivate this. When this is activated, this will not cause the gene to start expressing. Okay, it will stop this entire thing with just with the fl a flash of far red light. So far red light, pretty much you can think of it like the sleeping light. Yeah, the moment you shine it upon something, that thing is going to sleep, right? And red light is the waking up light. All right. Okay. So what about this? Yeah. This I just uh, want to share, share with you um, during the day and during the shade, what is the ratio is like. Yeah, so during the, um, the day, um, the active form of phytochromes predominates. In the shade, the um, inactive form of phytochromes dominates. So active form, active phytochrome. inactive phytochrome okay that's why uh, in shade tolerant species um, they have the tendency to grow taller to escape the shade because they want to have more of this um, active uh, phytochrome how can they activate the phytochrome with the presence of red light and red light will only be present um, in the higher uh, region of the canopy, right? So, yeah. So, uh, this is just a short description of what actually happening here. Yeah, yeah. So, this is, this is something that you can appreciate, okay? Uh, what's actually happening um, at the level of um, light as signal, in our case, red light, and also the receptor, the phytochromes, how it does get activated. Okay, so another uh, image uh, for you uh, to, to understand what's going on. So you have your um, um, your phytochrome, chromophore. Uh, remember, chromophore is, is the part that, that, that gives the color. Yeah, remember I, I give you the, the definition? A part of molecule responsible for its color. Okay, right. So... Um, yeah, so it this is pretty much like what we have here, okay? So this is just for, for your review. So, um, finally, um, photoreceptor also um, cause uh, the balance of cicadar radio. Cicadar radio, you can uh, uh, think of it like the biological clock. Okay, because some plants 
um, they they need to have um, a regular amount of um, active phytochrome and inactive phytochrome. The ratios need to be correct so that it knows, oh, this is day, this is night. So that's why um, I, I, I am highlighting this, okay? Plants do not have watch, do not have handset, do not have um, clock on the wall to know whether, um, oh, this is uh, 10 o'clock, this is 3 p.m., this is 6 p.m. They do not have that. So plants relies on the relative abundance of uh, active phytochromes and inactive phytochromes to know what times of the day it is and how long the day is that it is experiencing okay so that they can behave accordingly okay for example some plants um, uh, lower the leaves in the evening and raise them in the morning why this is important during the day they need to intercept radiation the sunlight as much as possible so that they can get uh, to do the photosynthesis maximally during the evening there is no need to do so so they sense this by these um, ratios of active and inactive um, phytochromes. Okay, so this photo period is also important, not only um, for the positioning of the leaf, but also for the uh, flowering. Okay, so photo period is the relative length of day and night, and photo periodism is the phenomenon, the physiological response due to the photo period uh, uh, duration. Okay, so and you can. This is where it comes again the concept of short day, long day, and day neutral plant. Okay, so uh, here's a simple example for you. Um, we got the short day plants, plants um that require um short, shorter amount of daylight in order to flower, and you have a long day plant, which uh, require longer, relatively longer time of um, um, daytime in order for them to flower. Okay, so this is why um, plants like this, like the chrysanthemum, um, in in I think in Kamara Highland, that's why they uh, the the grower there they turn on the light uh, during the night because they they don't want the plant to flower before the time okay so they can control the flowering okay i'm not sure chrysanthemum uh, uh why i mean like they turn on the light to prevent flowering or to stop flowering yeah but the concept is similar uh to to to, to this okay and because if the flower comes all at once and there is no buyer for the flowers who's going to buy who's going to experience the loss so when they control the amount of short day and long day, that's why uh, the flower can be uh, in the market continuously throughout the year. So there is a very good um, horticultural practice there, right? So for day, day neutral plants, uh, they don't care about this. Uh, okay, so as long as uh, they got uh, enough light to do photosynthesis, eventually they will flower. Okay, so these are true for uh, many plants which live in temperate um, region. Okay, plants in our region, in tropical region, usually they are day neutral. Okay, at, at least so far that, that I've seen, uh, no, nobody cares so much about, about light because um, we, we, we are quite clear to the equator. Our, our light is, is almost identical for day and night. All right? Yeah. All right. Okay, so I think that's all for your signal transduction le uh, lesson today. Okay, just bear in mind one thing. Just because I only focused on uh, phytohormones as signals and also light as signals, there are many other signals that are present surrounding the plants. Gravity, uh, one of them, of course. And you got pathogen, carbohydrate, CO2. There are many things, salt, anything. And these can be the uh, act as signals and the plants will have specific response to interpret the signals and 
cause the corresponding um, response uh, so that the plants can ensure its survival and complete its life cycle. Right? Okay, <clears throat> I think that's all for today. Um, any question? Uh, what time now? 9.35. All right, uh, I'll wait and, uh, for another five minutes. Uh, if you've got any question until 9.40, okay? Doctor. Yeah. Uh, for the uh, critical night light, night length, to. Yeah. So in a sense, uh, short day ni, there are the uh, certain ratio for PR dengan PFR lah kan, for it to flower. Yeah, all all plants that that's how they they consider. When you see this dark here, it, it doesn't mean complete darkness. It just mean the abundance of inactive phytochromes. Yeah. You can so, see a so, light. It's it's it, it means darkness to plant. So so uh so every species to are the different kind of ratio lam Yeah depending depending on whether they are short day, long day or day neutral. Remember, darkness does not mean complete darkness to the point you cannot see the face of your friends and you step on the foot. No. Darkness is just enough having lots of um, um, inactive phytochromes that, that predominate, predominates. All right, um, so for, for tomorrow, uh, you can go straight to Lab D. We are going to learn about uh, light quantification tomorrow, okay? And um, it shouldn't take long, so let's please be on time, okay, so that we can finish this uh, quickly. Uh, you're going to learn about the, the, the concept of light quantification and also the uh, instruments um, 
a demonstration as well. Okay, so you're going to have a tour around to take light reading, both uh, um, light quantity and also light quality. Okay, so that's all for today's. Thank you for joining. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.